Welcome back to another episode of the Four Train Savages podcast, episode number 131. And Tyler, today we welcome on a very special guest to the pod, the voice of the New York Yankees on the Yes Network, Michael K. Michael, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, guys. Thank you for joining us. So, um, yeah, we'll just hop right into it. We would like to know how you would evaluate what the Yankees did this offseason with re-signing Aaron Judge, signing Carlos Rodon, and the other moves that transpired. Well, obviously, the biggest thing they had to do, job one, was they had to sign Judge uh, for several reasons. On field, obviously, he's their best player. He's, he's arguably the best player in the major leagues at this point coming off a 62 home run season. And also you have to realize, and I think the Yankees realize this as well, this is the entertainment industry and the fans adore Aaron Judd. So I think it was sign him at any price, however many years he, he wanted, and they got that done. Then they expanded their payroll and they got Rodon, which I thought was really important. Now also considering with the injury to Frankie Montas, that becomes even more important because everybody else would move up a spot if Rodon wasn't there. Uh, the one thing that they didn't accomplish during this offseason, and the offseason is not over yet, is left field is, is still a very big question mark. Mm -hmm. But, you know, re-signing Anthony Rizzo was a big deal as well. And maybe that was a little bit of a hint that Judge was going to come back because the two of them are so close. But, you know, the, the deal they got Rizzo for is actually a pretty good deal when you see how the market exploded. You know, two years that I think if he goes, if they pick up the third year option, 17 or 18 a year is pretty good in this market. Yeah, no, I, Michael, I totally agree. I thought this was a real statement year in a way for not just Brian Cashman, but specifically Hal Steinbrenner and how he interacted with Aaron Judge and got everything done. But you mentioned Frankie Montas and obviously Domingo Herman. We expect to slide into that fifth role. Do you think there's a, a big drop off there in terms of floor to ceiling production? Or are you comfortable with Herman in that five role or potentially a Herman and Clark type of deal or, you know, kind of see what we can get from there? Well, I mean, to be totally honest, if, if Frankie Montas was going to be what they expected him to be before he had the shoulder injury in Oakland and then late last season, he's a better pitcher mm -hmm. than Herman. Uh, but, you know, Herman is serviceable and certainly can do the job, and he certainly has he has uh, stretches where he can be dominant. But, I mean, we can't kid anybody. Montas was being counted on heavily, and, you know, they say a month, but, you know, this is a shoulder injury that bothered him in Oakland. Then it bothered him last year with the Yankees. Then after an entire offseason, it's still bothering him. So to me, that's a concern. But um, you know, they do have the arms to fill in the slot, obviously, especially after getting Rodon. You know, if if, if Herman's not sharp, they could they could use Clark Schmidt, as you mentioned. But yeah, it's it's a drop off. You know, you can't put lipstick on a pig. Yeah. I wouldn't say it's a huge drop off, but it's a drop off. Yeah. I mentioned to Rob last pod, I said we all kind of talked ourselves into um being comfortable and happy with Frankie Montas in the fifth spot. We were like, Hey, that's kind of the worst compliment you could get as a starter. I feel like at some point is, Hey, we're cool with you in the fifth spot. We're cool with you almost on the bench, but now that he's not there, we'll definitely see how it, uh, how it plays out long-term. Well, you know what, when, when they, obviously everybody's first choice was, was Castillo last year, Yeah, but they didn't want to part with, with what the Reds wanted from the Yankees. I don't blame them. The, uh, they probably wanted either Peraza or Volpe or Dominguez and, Yankees thought that was too steep a price to pay. So they moved on to their next, which was Montas. And he was highly regarded. But, um, you know, it's hard to pitch when you're not feeling great. And, you know, if he's healthy on this staff, he'd be, you know, a three or a four starter because Severino is so good when he's healthy. But I see what you're saying about the fifth starter. But right now he's just uh, he's just in a in hold. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so you you kind of hinted at, what could they potentially do with maybe left field? Because that's the big concern that even Yankee fans will, even after all of the offseason moves that did happen, getting Judge, getting Rodon, getting Canely back, they'll say, well, what's going on with the left side of the, really the entire field when you look at third base and shortstop and then left field. So we heard the jerks and Profar rumors yesterday, and that had the Yankee Twitter very, the streets were hot with that. So do you think and, and there were rumors that coming into the coming into the seat or into spring training that it's looking like it's going to be a battle between Aaron Hicks and Oswaldo Cabrera. So do you see that them making a move late into spring training or around spring training similarly, similarly to what they did when they traded for IKF and Donaldson, even though 
were not the biggest fan of the, that trade at that time. But do you see them kind of as it heads in that they could make another deal? I think they're still trying. Um, you know, obviously Reynolds is on everybody's radar, but the Pirates, they have a guy who's a good player who has three years left before he becomes a free agent. They're not in any hurry and they are asking for King's ransom. And I don't think the Yankees want to do it. I mean, you hear things like from the group of Peraza, Volpe, and Dominguez, they want at least two of those three. And the Yankees are probably thinking that's too much. So right now that's on hold unless, unless the Pirates come down. I don't think the Pirates will come down because, again, there's no urgency. As for Profar, you know, I, I heard that John Morosi, uh, you know, clip, and I really respect John a lot. But when he mentioned that Jerks and Profar is looking for $15 million a year, that's, well, that's a non-starter. I mean, yeah. He, yeah. I mean, when you look, the Red Sox just paid Adam Duvall seven a year for one year. And Duvall, you could argue, is a better player than Jurickson and Profar. Now, Scott Boris is Jurickson's agent and obviously can ask for anything. But I would be absolutely stunned if anybody gives them $15 million a year. Now, if the price drops precipitously, maybe the Yankees would be interested. But, guys, to be honest, he doesn't have all the skill sets that the Yankees like. You know, he is a switch hitter. He's a pretty good defender. But if you look inside the offensive numbers, they don't jump off the page at you for an analytic team. So I think that, you know, they would go that route if, in fact, he is um, more reasonable in, in terms of price. But you know it, and Yankee fans don't want to hear it. They they do have Aaron Hicks signed yeah. Yeah. for three more years at $10 million a year. So I think they will give him a shot because there's something still in there. He's been a massive disappointment for the first four years of the contract. But – I guess you can dream on the fact that he does have a decent on base percentage and um, he's not a bad left fielder and his arm looked like it got better toward the end of the year, but that's not their ideal situation. But, you know, as you mentioned, it'll probably be at, at the start of spring training between Hicks and, and Cabrera. But remember one thing, guys, you know, they, they can rejigger the team at the trade deadline. That's, yeah. that's always what good teams do. So, they could see for two months exactly what's cooking, what's working. And then by that point, some teams will have fallen out of a, a wild card race and some left fielders that might not be available now might shake free and maybe the Yankees can investigate that. Yeah. I think the biggest gripe that Yankee fans have consistently with Aaron Hicks is that somehow the ball always finds him in the worst time. I, you know, that happened quite a few times last year and it just gives Yankee fans a reason to be upset. But I like what you said. I think Jerks and Profar is pretty much has the same ceiling as Aaron Hicks in the long run. Um, but we talked about Peraza and Volpe a little bit, or Volpe, excuse me. Um, do you think there's a world, Michael, where if if Donaldson has a similar year towards last year, say he had, you know, the glove is really there, he's playing great defense, the the offensive numbers are are next to nothing. Is there a world that we live in where there's a possibility that Peraza and Volpe could one of the two could potentially play more games at third? than Donaldson strictly, you know, not regarding injury. Well, there, there's a couple of layers to that. Um, I don't think there's a world. I think the only way you'd see both of them would be if you know, DJ LeMahieu is healthy and mm. then that would free them up maybe to think about trading Torres. Then, you know, at least that Peraza or Volpe could play second or DJ could play second. And then if Donaldson is struggling offensively, then they could always move DJ LeMayu over to third. Yeah. They're comfortable with him. But guys, I got to tell you, and I, and I said this uh, on the radio show the other day, so many fans have come up to me and said, it's really a shame the Yankees aren't able to trade Donaldson. And I'm telling you, they don't want to trade him. No. They that, love him. That they scares me a little bit. They absolutely love him. <laughs> they love the defense that he plays. And they look at, and if you heard Jack Curry's interview last night on the hot stove with Boone, they just think that the offense is still in there and that last year was an outlier that he can still hit. And, yeah, you know, they love his defense. He is a really good defensive player. So anybody who's thinking the Yankees are trying to dump that $25 million, they're not. They really like him a lot. They really like him a lot. So I think he's it. I mean, he's got a year left on his contract, and I think he'll play it out. Yeah. To be we fair, they probably, they probably know the floor, and they're just banking on the ceiling is, is what I'm guessing. Good way to put it. Yeah. yeah, we've been saying that all offseason. We see Yankees Twitter talking about it. How can we dump Donaldson? It's just it's probably it's not realistic to really do when you got that money committed. Um, but I wanted to bring it back to to the past season and talk about 
the Aaron, the absolute insane run that and season that Aaron Judge went on. Um, and just the the history that you were able to witness in the broadcast booth and obviously us as as fans. And I was curious to know where did and obviously he gave us a few of the moments with 60, 61, 62, but I was curious where did those calls rank for you personally in your career calling Yankee games and and where where would those go up for you? Was it a was it 60 that was better for you? 62, 61? How did it go? Well, I mean, it's a good question. And and because I'm so lucky and I, I know I am, I, I hope people realize to be the Yankee announcer for as long as I have and see many great moments. You know, when, when you have a record breaking home run like that and a record tying home run, it should be in the top three. But, you know, that darn Derek Jeter kind of like moved in the top. <laughs> and won't leave. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, w- I was happy with all three calls. Uh, if you want me to rank them, I'd say that. Uh, everything put together, guys, the best one with all the production and the fact that we had the mom and Roger Maris Jr. sitting with each other was probably 61 because, I mean, everything just came together, the pictures and obviously the achievement of getting 61 and the fact that I could squeeze in the Phil Rizzuto thing, which was kind of an homage to his call of Roger Maris Mm -hmm. at 61. That would probably be my favorite of the three. 60 would be my second. Favorite in 62 would probably be my third, but I'm not embarrassed by any of them. I think they, they're, they're okay. And, and, and probably the best compliment I, I got was after the day after he hit the 62nd, I was in the, in, the, in the clubhouse in Texas. And out of the blue, he just calls me over his locker and he goes, that was a really good call. Thank you. Oh, that, that must have been awesome. It really is a good feeling because it's not about ego. It's not about, you know, you want to be part of history. You're not part of history. Just to a small extent, you're kind of the soundtrack. But I never want to uh, screw up a call like that because that person has to live with that screw up on their great moment, which might take away from their great moment. I just want to be solid enough where it's not even an issue. And Mm -hmm. I don't think it was. And the fact that, you know, I didn't initiate the contact. He came over to me and said that he thought it was a really good call. That meant a lot to me. And that's that's really the only thing I look for in that call. I don't I even told Derek Judah this. I, I never want to embarrass the moment. So. As long as I didn't do that, I'm cool. Hey, I think I think we can speak for a lot of Yankee fans that you definitely brought the moment into our living room. It, it really, it definitely felt like that. Uh, but I'll tell last you question. Thing, before, I'll tell you one yeah. thing. Of all the great moments I've had the opportunity to call, those three home runs were probably the most stressful because of now with the advent of social media, which wasn't around when I said history with an exclamation point and, mm-hmm. and all that and – um, you know, Derek Jeter history, you know, what was that fantasy reality? It wasn't as, as prevalent then. Everybody had an opinion. Everybody was going to critique it. Everybody was like t- giving me calls. And I said, dude, don't, don't, don't tell <laughs> you what call to make. Yeah. <laughs> when the ball could be actually hit out of Yankee stadium and that's going to like supersede the call. So you can't plan calls like that. So there was a lot of stress, m- much more than I cared to admit at the time, but I- I'm just glad I got through it. Okay. Wasn't there, wasn't there, I think there was a game in Fenway, I think where Coney and I, I don't know if it was Flaherty were talking to you about talking through uh, your calls and what you would do. And you were just sitting in the back, not and just hearing them and you were just chuckling. So I, th- I think we saw that on full display of how they were kind of, Well, you know, what's funny with Coney, as you guys know, he's, he's a prankster and he knows exactly stuff that I'm going through and he knows exactly the pressure that I was under. So he just wanted to lift the curtain for the world, <laughs> tell everybody exactly what I was dealing with and also send a message to the people that I was dealing with that stuff, you know, just back off because, you know, just working with David, you realize why he was such a great teammate because even in our small little world, and yes, he is the best teammate. He's a go-to guy. If anything's going wrong, you have to deal with like up higher ups. You just let David do it. He's, he's the absolute best. I believe it. What a guy. I love listening to you three, especially you, Paul, and David, when uh, when we get the chance. But um, last question before we uh, let you go, Mike. We appreciate your time. Um, so I'm an avid listener of your show, The Michael K Show, and you guys are on there all the time. People are calling in, joking, calling you Yankee boy and whatnot. <laughs> How, as, as people, me and Rob, are, we're, we're smaller in the Twitter streets, but we're growing. How can we do God's work and kind of extinguish that in some way? <laughs> but I, th- I think we've learned after you know the postseason that hey michael k is not yankee boy <laughs> well i mean that I, I would have said that uh you know i i was pretty harsh on them 
uh, in the Houston series, which didn't yeah. please a lot of people with the Yankees. So, I, I, social but, media loved it though. Yeah, it's funny. You, you, if you please social media, you're probably not pleasing your boss <laughs> <laughs> and, and the people that actually you know control whether you're employed. But um, you can't really please everybody. You just have to be true to yourself. It, it's it's tough. It, it, it's tough having a radio show because people go, oh, Kay's a different person on the radio show than he is on the games. Yeah, it's a different, different job. <laughs> I'm not there to give my opinions on the games. That's David and Paul and Flaherty. They're giving their opinions. I'm just kind of like the point guard. But in the radio show, I've got to give an opinion. Otherwise, I don't have a show. But I just think that's it's become a thing now. People, people like saying it, Yankee boy, but... If they understood the stuff that I take from both sides, they wouldn't. They would understand it's it's not Yankee boy. But you know the fact that you're offering and you guys are such big Yankee fans that means something to me because I mean I, I truly do the stuff that I say. I really feel nobody's telling me what to say, and I'm not I'm not like pumping anybody up or putting lipstick on a pig. I'm just saying what I believe, and that's what I've done. You know the 32 years that I've been the Yankee announcer, and that's what I'll continue to do. And Will it rub people the wrong way? Yes. Sometimes it rubs fans the wrong way because that's not what they want to hear. I mean, they're so like pumped up and, you know, they want action right away and have to realize baseball's like a stew. It's not a microwave sport. Mm -hmm. It's got to breathe a little bit and changes will be made in due time. And, you know, one of the things that I'm getting jumped on, I'm sure you guys see, I, when, when they were about to sign Rodon, I said, not a, you know, Rodon's going to be a big deal, but they're working on something even bigger. And I mean, they haven't they haven't done it. I never mm -hmm. said they were going to definitely do something bigger. I said they were working on it, which they were. And obviously it, it hasn't happened and it might not happen. But people have good memories and, you know, they, they have screenshots and stuff. Oh, like the that. Internet never forgets. <laughs> no, never forget. So I, I, I'm certainly aware of that. By I'm not somebody who like comments on things during games on the Internet because you could have egg all over your face and then you're in all, you're on cold, you know, old takes exposed and stuff like that. But it is what it is. A small price to have such a great job. <laughs> well, Thank we you, appreciate Michael. you keep doing it. Um, we'll let you go. We really appreciate your time. Real quick, I know you, you guys are talking probably a lot of Giants today. Who do you got in the game tomorrow? I'm a huge Giants fan. I don't know how we're feeling against Philly. When this comes out, it'll probably be over and the pain will be over, but, you know, or maybe the jubilation, but I don't know. What do you think? Well, I hope you don't hate me for this, but I'm <laughs> leaning toward picking the Eagles because I, I just think the Eagles are better. Uh, I guess a lot of it falls on Jalen Hurts. If Jalen Hurts is close to 100%, they should win the game. Yeah. Because, I mean, they've got 70 sacks. Uh, they've got stars on both sides of the ball. It, it, it comes down to Hurts. The Giants have, have exceeded everybody's expectation, and I'm almost wondering when do they turn into the pumpkin. Maybe they don't. Maybe they yeah. end up in Phoenix for the Super Bowl, but I think it's a tough game. I really yeah. do. Giant fan, what do you think? They're playing you know hot. rooting for? Yeah, I, they're playing hot. <laughs> And I, I don't want to, I don't, the 2007 and 2011, I think it's always far-fetched because that was just a lot. But I, I think when they get to, if if they got to the conference championship, that's a whole other bag. But I, I think there's a potential they could squeeze a little magic here, but it all kind of depends. Like what is Hertz? Are they really saying that he's, how healthy is he? How, what, what's going on there? So we'll have to see, but well, I think they're playing their best offensive football of the season at the right time, which is what, what we got to have. I don't know if this will make you feel better. It might make you feel worse. But LaGreca has said if they win Saturday, they're going to the Super Bowl. I, Don, <laughs> Don may be a smart man. I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping. But uh, we'll, we'll let you go to them and, and uh, Don and Peter. So thanks very much for joining us. Uh, best of luck with the season coming up. We're hoping that we could see some more winning Yankee baseball and, and continue to listen to you on the call. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Build up the podcast and uh, I'll pop on again if you need me. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you.